One night in May 1943, Rudolf Schoenert approached an RAF bomber in his BF-110. Guided by radar, he would typically have made this attack from directly astern, where the Lancaster, Stirling and Halifax had relatively weak defensive armament. But today wasn't a typical day. Schoenert had been experimenting with an alternative idea for two years, and now, as the leader of his own squadron, he was going to try it out. His BF-110 had been modified with a pair of MG FF 20mm cannons placed in the rear fuselage, firing upwards through two holes in the canopy glazing. Schoenert was thus able to approach his quarry unseen from below. Most British bombers lacked a ventral turret, and those that had one gave the gunner a very limited view. A short burst from the cannons, delivered from close range, was all it took to send his quarry down in flames. Schoenert's tactics were not new. Upward firing guns had been a feature of early attempts to attack Zeppelins on their occasional sorties over the UK during the Great War. Based on those experiences, the RAF had spent the interwar period attempting to procure an interceptor able to employ such tactics, passing over cow gun armed biplanes and eventually procuring the Bolton Paul Defiant. But Schoenert made the idea work in practice. Conversion kits were issued to other night fighter squadrons using the BF-110, Junkers 88 and Dornier 217. They called the tactic Schraga music, a term that had previously been used to describe the unusual time signature of jazz music. RAF losses mounted. In a classic example of the value of Occam's razor, High Command ignored tales of night fighter attacks from below, ascribing losses to flak and even choosing to believe that the Germans were using a flak shell designed to detonate in a way that resembled a bomber exploding. Only the fact that the tactic was difficult to employ and only a few pilots mastered it saved the RAF from much worse losses. Eventually, they strengthened ventral defences and interspersed mosquito night fighters in the bomber streams to detect the German interceptor radars. But even as late as February 1945, Schraga music was causing horrific losses to night bomber raids. The Japanese also had some success using JN-1 geckos using the same tactic against B-17s and Liberators. These chastening experiences were front of mind when the US set about procuring a replacement for its P-61 night fighter. The original specification that led to the much ridiculed F-89 Scorpion thus asked for both front and rear gun turrets able to fire upwards at a bomber. The speed of jet aircraft and the need for sensible aerodynamics made conventional turrets impractical. Therefore, Northrop's proposal incorporated a gun mounting with the point of rotation near the muzzles and the guns describing an elliptical cone of fire. Northrop's forward turret mounted four T-31 20mm cannons with a plus or minus 15 degree angular travel in the vertical horizontal planes. The rear turret was of similar configuration with angular travels of plus or minus 15 in the vertical plane and plus or minus 13 in the horizontal. Automatic gun laying equipment was provided with the antennas for the radars mounted at the extreme front and rear of the fuselage adjacent to the gun muzzles. The tail turret was eliminated in a September 1946 specification change, but so central was the nose turret to the Army Air Force's requirement that Northrop made a separate XP-89 nose turret mock-up for inspection. The four 20mm weapons were mounted on a central structural carriage with a radar fire control system amid the guns inside the turret's forward ball portion. The breech end of the gun carriage was mechanically moved within the nose structure to provide that 30-degree cone of fire. This concept was an organically developed Northrop design, and it's separate from the Martin turret installed on a later F-89A. The Northrop turret was never produced. Instead, four fixed 20mm cannons were ultimately specified in a conventional installation. The desire for the turret didn't go away, though. During the first half of 1947, there was a test flight with a simulated nose turret that had protruding guns. This test indicated that such a turret arrangement would be possible in practice. So in August 1947, the Air Force wrote to Northrop to let them know that they had contracted with Martin for the turret and Northrop would be paid to determine the changes needed on the XP-89 to fit it. A year later, on August 30, 1948, the Martin turret 
now designated as the AF Type D1 Fire Control System, was still very much part of the Air Force's plans for incorporation in either or both the XF-87 and the XF-89 programs, should they be selected for production. The fad for rockets, however, killed the fad for turrets. Alongside this was the realisation that it was more useful for an interceptor to carry a large radar in the nose than a complicated gun turret. Some fighters weren't encumbered by a radar, though. At around the same time as the experiments with the F-89, a P-80A shooting star was tested with a modified rotating nose housing two 50 caliber Browning machine guns, which could be elevated up to an angle of 90 degrees. This doesn't appear to have been the same as the Martin turret on the much larger F-89. But even with the relatively modest battery of 250 calibers rather than the 420mm cannons of the Martin turret, when the guns were fired, the P-80A bucked and trembled, and the accuracy of fire left very much to be desired. The idea was therefore abandoned. Turret experiments in the US were not restricted to bomber interception. Despite all of the benefits of jet propulsion, one of the drawbacks of jets was the speed at which engagements took place. The faster pace of combat meant that pilots had a shorter time window in which to use their guns to engage enemy aircraft. Although much research was underway on the development of guided rockets and missiles, such as the GAR-1 program in the Air Force and the AIM-9 Sidewinder, forward-firing cannons were still the primary air-to-air weapon of the day. The Navy therefore wondered whether what was needed was some form of turreted cannon that could rotate with the passing aircraft and confront it in what was essentially an off-bore sight engagement, much like the turreted guns of bombers. As a result of contracts that had been set out in mid-1949, experiments were conducted with an Emerson Electric Quad 50 caliber turret gun mounted on an F9F3 Panther. The four guns were supplied with 1,400 rounds of ammunition. The turret enabled the pilot to aim his four guns in any forward direction, plus 20 degrees behind the vertical. The turret was more of a revolving nose cone that could rotate 360 degrees and then the guns could traverse back 20. It was quick reacting, being able to roll 100 degrees per second, and the guns could traverse at 200 degrees a second. A small analogue guidance computer was installed and it could aim the guns in a 5 degree cone at the target while applying the appropriate lead. Grumman and Navy pilots flew the modified Panther but not in dogfight situations. It therefore wasn't clear whether the system would actually work in a combat setting. Furthermore, the turret and the computer were heavy and bulky. The computer was the size of a range cooker, which meant that it occupied a large proportion of the rear fuselage and left no space for anything else. It also couldn't make eggs or any other snacks for the crew. The 19 pieces of equipment associated with the gun and the turret added £100 to the Panther's all-up weight. With the Sidewinder making progress at White Sands, the Panther turret went nowhere. Designers in the Soviet Union had also come to the conclusion that high speeds would make it hard to hold guns on a target for long enough to achieve a kill. In 1951, MiG trialled such an arrangement on a MiG-15, but tests showed that it didn't work effectively because the standard forward fuselage was retained and thus elevation angles were too restricted. The MiG OKB didn't give up on the idea, although their main idea seems to have been to use the movable gun system for attacking ground targets rather than in a dogfight situation. With their MiG-15 well into production, they had another try. This aircraft had a completely redesigned nose, which removed the fresco's prominent nose intake, replacing it with two small lateral intakes. Its designation was MiG-17SN. The fuselage was area-ruled around the cockpit so that the intakes could be semi-recessed into the fuselage sides. It's a very neat piece of engineering to try at a concept with such a high chance of failure. A streamlined nose housed the guns and associated mechanisms, and it lengthened the aircraft by three and a half feet. At its very tip was a stalk radar to provide aiming directions and an SRD-1M gun ranging radar. They were linked to an ASP-4NM optical gun sight. Changes didn't end with the nose and the intakes. The canopy was also re-engineered from scratch to improve visibility and reduce drag. The main gear doors had to be changed because of the new fuselage contouring and inside them the main wheels and brakes were strengthened. Somehow space was found for an additional 11 gallons of fuel as well. 
The £1,033 cannon installation was developed by N.A. Volkov, who had also developed the original weapons palette for the MiG-15. It could elevate 27 degrees and depress 11, and it contained three Makarov AM-23 23mm cannons, each with 1,250 rounds per minute fire rate. They were mounted asymmetrically, with two on the port side and one on the starboard. The system weight broke down as £314 for the elevating mounts, £258 for the guns, and £304 for the ammunition. The rest was control and other equipment. The pilot controlled cannon elevation by turning a knob on the throttle, the same system that had been used on the initial MiG-15 experiment. All of these modifications took time, and it was only in February 1954 that the gun system was ready for state trials. These were mostly done with the turret fitted to an IL-28 rather than on the modified MiG-17SN, which was still being perfected. When sufficient issues with the modifications were ironed out, the MiG-17SN made 130 test flights, including 15 strafing ground targets. 15,000 rounds were fired in total. The tests revealed a host of problems. Just as Lockheed had found with the shooting star, when the guns were pointed up or down and then fired, the aircraft would pitch up or down violently, spoiling the pilot's aim. Above 10 degrees of deflection, an accurate shooting was completely impossible. McCoyan concluded that without automatic control, a turret system wouldn't work on a light aircraft. The SN itself was also a bit of a basket case. Lateral air intakes were a really new thing in the Soviet Union in the early 1950s, and it wasn't just MiG that struggled to make them work. On the SN, this led to frequent compressor surges as airflow changed. Amongst other things, this made a restart in flight very unpredictable, which isn't really what you want in a single-engined fighter. Different aerodynamics and greater weight blunted the Fresco's performance too. SN was 33 knots slower than the basic Fresco A. High-altitude maneuverability was much worse. Strangely enough, though, the test pilot's conclusions were that there was some use for the aircraft as a low-level strafing aircraft, and that a small batch should be made for close air support and interdiction. This recommendation wasn't taken up. The MiG-17SN was the last jet-powered turret fighter experiment. Although not the most effective to start with, early air-to-air missiles went into service a few years later, removing the need for a moving gun system. The only jet fighters to deploy with a gun system that didn't fire directly down the roll axis were the FJ-2 and FJ-3 Furies. And we all know how well that went. <laughs>